Hey everyone, hope you had a great weekend. Happy Monday. We're going to start our week off for the case of the missing manatee with chapter four. Just a reminder before we get started, please have your uh, detective notebook or a piece of paper out. That way you can jot down some ideas, uh, maybe some questions that you might have, okay? Some things that need to be solved. Uh, we're going to be doing this for the rest of the year. It's nice and handy to maybe even uh, mark it off as your missing manatee section. Okay, so grab that notebook so you're ready to write down some clues. Remember, here are the elements of mystery. Detective, victim, suspects, witnesses, alibi, red herring, evidence, crime, and clues. These elements of mystery might not always be a part of each and every chapter, but we will talk about the different uh, chapters that reveal the detective or victim or witnesses or even our suspect. All right, before we start our reading, you've guessed it, it is time for vocabulary time. Today we are going over three different vocabulary words. The first one is karaoke. Karaoke is a form of entertainment offered typically by bars and clubs in which people take turns to sing popular songs into a microphone over pre-recorded music. Okay, and this can be a lot of fun. Many people enjoy going to a, a bar or club and singing their favorite songs. Often there'll be a screen behind them that tells them the words. But it can become annoying when certain people sing off tune or really get into it when they should leave it up to the professionals, okay? So regardless, it is a lot of fun. We are going to uh, hear about it from the book with Mima, okay? And we met Mima in Chapter 3 at the end. Mima is Skeet's grandma. She is going to go uh, do some karaoke music or sing some karaoke music, and she's very serious about this. Okay, so chapter four, we pick up where Mima is going to go sing at a bar, and she is super, super serious. It is very important to her. Uh, the next um, vocabulary word we're going to go over is shiftless. Okay, so Skeet's mom calls Dirty Dan shiftless in this chapter, and just so you have an idea of that vocabulary word before you hear it, it can often be characterized as lazy, good for nothing, or a person with a lack of ambition. Okay, so it's not a compliment. She thinks that he wastes, you know, he wastes time, he is unemployed, he doesn't do any work, all he ever does is fish. So she doesn't like his personality. Next one is hammerhead. Now I'm just going to go over this. I'm sure every single one of you have heard of a hammerhead shark, but I want you to uh, have a better idea or image of them in your head, and that way it's more entertaining for you to hear about. Um, a hammerhead is a shark from tropical and temperate oceans that has a flat blade-like extension on either side of its head, okay? And the eyes and nostrils place at, at or near the ends. There are nine different species of hammerhead sharks in the world. So here is image of a hammerhead shark, which we all should pretty much recognize. Uh, they have their eyes at the uh, ends, and I'll just circle that right there. Bloop. Okay. So um, both ends, they have their eyes. Bloop. Um, and the other thing I just want to point out, and this is just a fun fact for you, is there are nine different hammerhead species, okay? So I'm not going to name them all. You can look them up later if you want. But I thought it was really interesting that they have nine different species. Um, we're going to hear about the hammerhead sharks a little bit later, but just so you have that in your head and you know what they are, there you go. So these are the vocabulary words for this chapter. All right, so before we start chapter uh, four, let's go over chapter three with a recap. The um, first part of the chapter three, Deputy Earl and Skeet return to the police station on a boat. Along the way, we met a few characters. The first character was Blink. Blink is a 30-year-old, but has like the mindset of a six-year-old. So he's a little slower um, due to some things that uh, were wrong with him when he was born. He also has a dog that he named Blinky, okay? And just to read the little uh, part about Blinky, he sa it says, Blinky was the most pathetic looking creature you could imagine, okay? So he had matted hair, uh, flea-ridden, insect bites, just, a, a, you know, a sad dog, okay? And then the other character we learned about was uh, Larry. And Larry is the uh, owner of the marina. They didn't really give us much about him, but I'm sure we'll learn more about him later. Uh, 
what also happened in the uh, story was Ski and Blink played a flip game, okay? So a flip game with a quarter. Um, it, this is a really cool thing because it shows how Ski is with Blink. You know, they have a, a fairly good relationship. Next part is uh, Deputy Earl made a report about the dead manatee, but wasn't sure anything was going to come of it. Okay, so again, who knows? Uh, like, is anybody else going to actually help anything or is Ski on his own with this? And then the last part, the last character we meet in chapter three was Mima, which is Skeet's grandma. Okay, so I'm going to give you a heads up now. One of the questions you need to answer by the end of this chapter is like what characteristics and what type of person is Mima. So you should be paying attention to how Mima acts, what Mima says, and the type of characteristics. Uh, that way you can describe her um, character traits. All right, so we're just about ready to start. We're going to jump right into uh, Mima's little fun karaoke time. Enjoy, guys. Chapter 4 Mima hogged the bathroom for about an hour, taking a long bath and fooling with her hair. Before she came out, she called to Mom and me. Don't you two look yet. I want you to see me with my whole outfit on so you can get the full effect. Mom shook her head and gave me a look and a little smile as if to say, Here she goes again. For a mother and daughter, Mom and Mima were pretty different. It was weird, but I thought Mac and Mima were more alike. Mom was always saying Mima ought to act her age. Mima said, why should she, with Mom acting old, enough like an old stick in the mud for both of them. Once they didn't know I was listening, Mom said Mima was embarrassing. Mima said she couldn't understand why Mom had to be the aunt in the lemonade at every picnic lunch. I tried to stay out of it, but it seemed to me that Mima was having a lot more fun than Mom. And anyway, Mima never embarrassed me. A couple of minutes later, Mima hollered from the bedroom. I'm coming out. You ready? We're ready, Mima, I hollered back. Bring it on. The door opened and Mima stood in front of us with her hands on her hips, posing like a movie star. Then she threw her arms out and spun around so she could get the whole picture. Her blonde hair was piled up high in loops and curls held with sparkly silver and blue clips. She was wearing her denim skirt, all decorated with silver fringe and sequins. Her jeans had a row of sequins down the side of each leg, which she must have just sewn on, and she was wearing a belt with a big silver heart-shaped buckle around her neck. She tied a red cowgirl bandana, and she was wearing her favorite red cowgirl boots. Well, she asked, what do you think? Wow, Mima, I said, you look like a singer on TV. Not too bad for an old grandma, am I? No way, you look great. Thank you, darling. She gave me a dazzling red lipstick smile, then snapping her fingers with one hand and holding a pretend microphone in the other, she launched into a song I'd heard her practicing around the house. It was called, These Boots Are Made For Walking." When she started singing, Mom clapped, and I stood up and cheered and let out my loudest whistle. Go, Mima, knock em dead. After a minute or two, she got to the part of the, of the song where she stops singing and sort of talks to her boots, telling them to start walking. At that, Mima held her chin up real high, pumped her arms back and forth, and marched in place, stomping her feet like anything. It was pretty spectacular. When she'd finished, I said... You got that contest won, Mima. No point in the rest of them even showing up. You really think so, Skeeter? She said, giving me a big, perfumey hug. I hope you're right. I'd dearly love to win that home karaoke setup they're giving out for the prize. Mom made a little choking sound in her throat right then, and I could tell she wasn't exactly thrilled about the prospect of Mima practicing new songs with musical backup right there in the living room. I said, that'll be great, Mima, and I meant it, too. We got to the River Haven Grill at 6 o'clock. The contest didn't start until 7, but Mima said she wanted to get a good seat and check out the competition. Mom and I ordered burgers, but Mima said her stomach was too jittery to eat. She ordered a Lone Star beer to get in the mood. I guess that's what cowgirls like to drink. We sat on the outside patio where the contest was going to be held and watched people as they drifted in. Mima checked everybody over with an eagle eye. Don't worry, Mima, I told her. Don't any of them look half as good as you. 
Thanks, darling, she said, but you can't always tell by looking. Sometimes a dull brown bird can make a mighty sweet song. Well, I guess, but still, I felt sure Meemaw would win. Then I heard Mom take a sudden sharp breath. I turned in the direction she was looking and saw Mac walk into the patio with Earl and Dirty Dan. There's Mac, I said. And look who he dragged in with him, Mom said dryly. They, the aptly named Dirty Dan. Kill me that Mom didn't like Dan. She called him shiftless because he didn't have a real job. I tried to explain to her that he didn't need a job. He made money at poker and by winning tarpon tournaments. If he was strapped for cash, he'd take a client out tarpon fishing for pay, but mostly he just fished for himself. Mom thought even fishing guys who worked regularly were shiftless, so her opinion of Dan was right down there in the mud and with the crabs. I guess Dan's four wives probably agreed with Mom, now that I thought about it. But I didn't care. Dan was a lot of things I hoped to be some day. And anyway, he was Max and Meemaw's friend. There was a famous story about Dan I never got tired of hearing. It always came with the warning. Don't even think of trying this yourself. One day when he was out fishing, Dan hooked up a giant tarpon. He fought it and fought it for about three hours. Finally, when it was getting tired, a hammerhead shark showed up and started circling around. They do that sometimes when they sense a fish is in trouble. They figure on getting themselves an easy meal. But there was no way Dirty Dan, the tarpon man, was going to give up his record tarpon to a shark. No, sir. So he jumped right into the water, which was only a couple of feet deep, with his rod in one hand and his fish club in the other. Some people think hammerheads are kind of a joke because they look so silly. I mean, they have those weird rectangular shaped heads that look like they were put on sideways and their eyes are way out on the ends. But they are seriously scary predators with huge mouths and rows and rows of real sharp teeth. They get big too. Anyway, Dan stood right in the water and whacked that 10 foot long monster on the head every time it came near his fish. After a while, the shark gave up and swam away. Each time I heard the story, I had to laugh, picturing that shark swimming off, wondering in its prehistoric little brain, what the heck is going on? Dirty Dan landed his record tarpon, and there wasn't a bite missing. He wasn't called the tarpon man for nothing. I'm going to go say hi, okay? I asked Mom. Sure, honey, she smiled at me when she said it, but it was one of those four smiles. I hated times like this when I wanted to be with both Mom and Mac like before, and the only way I could do that was to split myself down the middle. I'll be back in a sec, I said, and raced over to where Mac and his friends were taking seats across the patio. Hey there, Skeet, said Mac, grabbing me in a bear hug. I hear you got yourself deputized today. Or were you just trying to give Earl here a lesson on how to run a boat? Lord knows he could use it. You hear that, Skeet? said Earl, shaking his head sadly. You'd think your daddy would know better than to smart mouth an officer of the law. Dirty Dan said, I believe there's strict penalties for sass and a deputy. Isn't that right, Officer Earl? Yes, sir, said Earl, very strict. Pointing his finger at Mac, Earl said, looks like you're gonna have to bring the food and the beer Tuesday night, old buddy. No problem, Mac answered cheerfully. You two just bet the way you always do, and I'll have double my money back before eight o'clock. Then he looked at me and said, Earl told me how you found that manatee this morning. I nodded and looked hopefully at Earl, but he shook his head. No news yet. Strange the way it wasn't there when you went back, Mac went on. How do you figure a thing like that? I shrugged and said, I don't know, but I'd sure like to see the person who did it go to jail. And grinning at Dirty Dan, I imitated his deep voice and added, I believe there's strict penalties for that. I expected Dan to come back with a wisecrack, but instead he said, I believe I heard Max say you're on vacation from school. Is that right, Skeet? Yeah. Have you caught yourself a tarpon on a fly yet? No, I admitted. I've caught a couple on bait, though. Dan snorted. I knew what he thought about bait fishing for tarpon. To Dan, the only way to take one of the big, beautiful silver beauties was on a fly. You want to come tarpon fishing with me someday this week? He asked. 
Did I want to go tarpon fishing with Dirty Dan, the tarpon man? Do fish swim? I looked at Mac. Seeing the hesitation on his face, I knew what he was thinking. Mom wouldn't improve. But Mac also knew how badly I wanted to catch a tarpon on a fly, how many times I'd tried and failed. He'd taken me out a lot, but Mac was primarily a bait fisherman. Dirty Dan was a fly fisherman exclusively, and he was the best. With Dan, I had a real chance. Mac understood that. I willed him to say yes. What he said was, I'll have to talk to your mom about it, Skeet. Right. Mac couldn't make his own decisions about me the way he used to. He had to talk over every little thing with mom. I scowled in frustration. Mac gave my arm a reassuring squeeze. Don't you worry. I think it'll be all right. Turning to Dan, I said, thanks. I really hope I can come. If your mother says it's okay, you come to Max Tuesday night, said Dan. After I whoop these two at cards, we'll check your gear and tie up some flies. Wednesday morning, we'll go out, catch you a silver king. Deal? Deal, I said. Just then, music blared over the sound system, and the DJ stepped behind the podium and began fiddling with the microphone, which let out a loud squeal. It's the karaoke contest, I said. I better go back. Meemaw's singing. Dan's face broke into a big grin. Woo-wee, he said. This I want to hear. Mac and the others all turned to the table where Mom and Meemaw were sitting, waved and smiled. Meemaw waved back gaily, and Mom wiggled her hand half-heartedly. Go on, said Mac, and he gave me another hug. Don't worry, I'll talk to her, he said softly. Thanks, Mac, I said. I wanted to ask him what Mom had said to him on the phone that morning so he could tell me I'd heard wrong, or it was all a misunderstanding and he was coming back soon. But this wasn't the right time or place to talk. It was never the right time or place anymore. Feeling a familiar lump rising in my throat, I swallowed it quickly and said, See ya. The DJ was explaining that the winner of the contest would be the person who got the loudest applause after singing. So clap real loud for your favorite ladies and gentlemen, he told us, and my state-of-the-art, scientifically accurate applausometer will record the level. He held up something that looked like a half a clock with numbers on it from one to ten and a big arrow and everybody cheered. Let's begin now and find out who will be the lucky guy or gal to win this fantastic home karaoke machine. He pulled a slip of paper from a box and said, Please welcome our first contestant, Mrs. Arlene Kimball, who will be singing Proud Mary. Good, Meemaw said. I didn't want to go first. She gave me a wink and added, The darker it gets, the better I'll look up there. Arlene Kimball did an okay job, I guess, but I whispered to Meemaw, You'd give them, give that rolling on the river part a lot more pizzazz, wouldn't you, Meemaw? Shush now, she said, but she was smiling, and she gave my hand a little squeeze. The DJ cupped his hand to his ear to listen for the applause, then moved the meter to four. Arlene smiled kind of weakly and sat down next to a guy I figured was Mr. Kimball. He'd been cheering his head off anyway. The next lady sang a slow, sad song about the morning light coming after the dark, dark night. Her voice got real high and quivery toward the end. And with a tragic expression to go with the mournful words, she clutched at her throat with one hand and dropped her head, to show she was plain wrung out from the emotion of it all. I rolled my eyes at Mima, and she laughed. There was some polite clapping, and the meter registered, too. A few of the singers who followed were pretty good. We got a bad scare from a husband and wife team who scored an eight, and a young guy who couldn't sing for anything that had a lot of friends who clapped and cheered and whistled and stomped his score up to a nine. When it was Meemaw's turn, I was suddenly nervous as all get out, but she walked up there as if she owned the place. No embarrassed looks or bashful giggles for Meemaw. The minute she started snapping her fingers, I noticed everybody in the place sat up and paid real close attention. When she got to the part where she sang, One of these days these boots are gonna walk all over you. She narrowed her eyes and pointed out into the crowd, and it was clear to everyone that Mima was no one to mess with. She, then, during the talking part, she made her voice real low and dangerous, and the music got spiky and jazzy. Mima started her boots marching, and the crowd went crazy. When she was finished, Dirty Dan ran right up on stage and gave her a big hug and a kiss, lifting her right off the ground to do it. 
Well, I probably don't have to tell the rest. Mima scored a 10, and the DJ said she'd have gotten an 11 if the meter had had, had one. There were a few more contestants after that, and I felt sorry for them having to follow Mima. It was as if, as if they had the stuff and knocked out of them before they even started. Mac and Earl came over to the to congratulate Mima afterwards, and they helped Dirty Dan and me carry the karaoke machine out to Mom's car. Mom walked with us while Mima stayed to collect a few last compliments from her admirers. Mac told Mom he needed to speak to her, so I got into the car and they walked off into the parking lot a ways. I watched as they talked. I couldn't hear their exact words, but I didn't need to. I'd heard them argue so many times about what I was and wasn't allowed to do that I could pretty much imagine the conversation. Mom shook her head and Mac talked some more. I crossed my fingers, whispering over and over, please let me go, please, please, please let me go. Then Mom frowned and folded her arms over her chest. Please, 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 I murmured while she held on to her elbows and stared up into the sky, looking annoyed. It seemed like a long time. Finally, Mom looked at Mac and said loud enough so I could hear from the car, All right, but you're in charge. If that boy comes back with one hair on his head harmed, you and Dan are both going to have to answer to me. Mac nodded and said a few more words. Then Mom was walking toward the car. Mac headed back inside, but first he turned to me with the grin that made him look like a big, naughty kid and gave me a thumbs up. I could hardly believe it. I was going tarpon fishing with Dirty Dan. All right, I hope you enjoyed chapter four. Uh, now we're going to go in to answer some questions. So please go to MS Teams, click on forms, and answer these questions. I'm going to go over them a little bit just to help you out. It says, what type of character is Mima? Okay, and all you need to do is answer one sentence. Think about how she acted and what she did. So describe what type of character she is. The next one is name three character traits that describe Mima. This is different because you're going to name the character traits. There's a PDF in um, your assignment that shows you what type of character traits, or if you remember, please pick those. But you're going to choose three character traits. Please don't pick traits like nice, loud, like find character traits that really describe her, okay? Uh, what kind of relationship do Ski and Mima have? Now this one, I don't want you to just type and say, uh, Mima is Skeet's grandma, or Skeet loves his grandma. I'm, act, I'm asking how they interact together, okay? So what is, what is their relationship like? Uh, do they, you know, do they have a good relationship? Do they talk to each other? Stuff like that. So you would pull from this uh, chapter and tell me what makes you think they have a great relationship? How did they interact? The last question says, Ski is going fishing with Dirty Dan. What are you thinking? Good idea or bad idea? Why? Okay, so again, pull from the book. Pull f uh, from those ideas, those little clues we have. Is there something suspicious with Dirty Dan? Or do we think he's just a, you know, a fisherman and everybody mistakes him and he's just a good guy who loves to fish? So tell me your ideas now. Uh, give me about a sentence or two telling me if, if this was a good idea or a bad idea. All right, guys, I will see you tomorrow with Chapter 5.